Wow. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to be here in person? Yes. As President Biden said when he met President Putin, it's nice to meet face to face. <laughs> but here, you cannot click and go to another channel. But we hope you would not want to and will enjoy listening to our excellent speakers. Welcome, and welcome also to our online audience. Welcome to the eighth edition of Global Outlook Norway. And today the theme is recovery, question mark. You know, cultural differences are very interesting. Americans would say, recovery, yay, exclamation mark. And Norwegians, recovery, hmm, doubt, question mark. Talking about questions, our um, speakers are happy to take your questions at the end of their presentations, but because of COVID, we are not able to pass the microphones around. Uh, so instead, please text us your questions. It is very easy. Uh, some of you may have already um, uh, taken the uh, scan the uh, QR code, but those who haven't, you can log on to menti.com from your mobile, which I hope is on silent and then enter this conference code, which is 5460367. Uh, and then um, a box will open up, and please mention the name of the speaker you want to address the question to, and also your name if you want to, and please keep the question brief. And um, you can start texting your questions right away. My name is Anita and I'm today's moderator. Many of you have been here before, so you know the drill. In case of an emergency, please walk to the back where you have two exits. We are gathered here today at a time of global uncertainties, of an unfolding situation in Afghanistan. The shockwaves from Kabul reach Arundhati. Our first speaker, keynote speaker, Foreign Minister Sarayda cannot leave Oslo. As you know, Norway is a NATO member and also currently the uh, non-impermanent, or what do you call it, impermanent, non-permanent, the non-permanent member of uh, the Security Council in the United Nations. But she is determined to participate in Global Outlook. So she will join us very shortly, despite a heavy schedule. Uh, she will join us online in a few moments. So. Recovery, question mark. You know, over the centuries, there have been many pandemics, and one of the worst pandemic, a plague, was in the sixth century, during the time of the Roman emperor uh, Justinian. It was devastating, killing almost half the population of Constantinople, his capital, which at that time was about the size of Oslo today. Now, this is the sixth century, the pre-scientific era. Some would say that still continues. But in, this, uh, in, the, in the sixth century, the, uh, the people believed that a pandemic was God's way of teaching them a lesson. Four months later, the death rates start coming down a little bit, and Emperor Justinian declares, the pandemic is over, like some of our politicians today. So he says... The pandemic is over. God's education is finished. Now get back to business. What did back to business mean in the sixth century? It meant fighting wars, making peace, collecting taxes, building infrastructure, quite similar to what's going on today, right? So 1,500 years later, here we are doing more or less the same thing. Or will this pandemic be a wake-up call to make us do things differently, to address the real problems that we have, like climate crisis, like corruption, like income inequality. So what will recovery look like? Will it be back to business as usual, or will it be a new way forward? Let's find out. Our first keynote speaker is Norway's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ina Marie Eriksson Sarayda, and she needs no introduction. This is the fourth year that she is speaking at Global Outlook, and each and every time she has topped the charts. She has topped audience ratings. Here she is talking to us on post-pandemic, Norway in a complicated world. Foreign Minister.
We are so happy to see you and we miss your physical presence, but of course we understand the situation and uh, we are truly grateful that you have keeping your tryst or your date or your appointment with us. So welcome to your fourth Global Outlook. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, thank you for that introduction, Anita, and also uh, not least for the flexibility in allowing me to participate uh, digitally. Um, you know more than most people how much I had uh, enjoyed being in Arnold right now, and uh, especially because last year also was a, a digital event. So um, I'm, I'm really sorry that I cannot be there, but as you alluded to in your introduction, the very dramatic situation in Afghanistan uh, unfortunately means that I have to stay in Oslo to attend what is right now our most important task, which is leading the uh, operation to evacuate embassy staff and also our local Afghan employees and their families, which is quite complicated, as you can easily imagine when you look at the pictures from uh, from Kabul. And um, I know that that situation, of course, also is, is very much in the forefront of, of many of our minds these days, and including, I imagine, that of Tom, who you will meet later, who, uh, who also has served in, in Afghanistan. So with that introduction, I will also try to do today's topic uh, justice, even uh, even considering the circumstances. Now, imagine the area stretching from where you are right now in Arndal, in the south, all the way through forests, uh, across mountains, up to Trondheim uh, in the middle of Norway. And if you can just for one second imagine all of that on fire. And if you go back to January 2020, uh, the story on everyone's lips was the extreme wildfires in Australia. And before these fires were quelled, they had burned down an estimated 186,000 square kilometers, which then is equivalent to, to roughly all of the land area from Trondheim to Arndal. But of course, as we all know, these wildfires didn't remain as the biggest story of the year for very long, because February 1st last year, um, the Economist front page featured planet Earth wearing a face mask and asking how bad will it get? And ever since our collective attention has been fixed on the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and a year and a half later, uh, the fact is, to be very honest, we still don't know quite how bad it will get because the pandemic is still raging and it has already done untold damage. I mean, killing over 4 million people. And in 2020 alone, the World Bank estimates is that it has driven nearly 100 million people into poverty, which is an unprecedented increase. So the intention in about mentioning both these by, by introduction is not to play down either of them. It is rather to remind us that any notion of recovery needs to take into account the incredibly complex context of today. Uh, and in fact, in, in many parts of the world, one could imagine that a, that a question of how to achieve recovery from, from the crisis would be answered back with another question. Which of the crises are you referring to? And, and over the last uh, few years, it has sometimes seemed as if the foreign policy horsemen of the apocalypse have been allowed to, to run more or less wild. And I'd like to illustrate that with some examples. First, of course, inequality and populism have really fueled polarization and protectionism. And autocratic forces have challenged very hard-earned advances in the fields of, for instance, human rights. And that has also happened on our own continent. And not only foreign policy events, but foreign policy itself has felt more unpredictable. The second example is that great power rivalry has re-emerged as a defining feature of global politics. And it has really put what we cherish so deeply, multilateral cooperation, alliances and institutions under a lot of strain. My third point is that changes to our climate, and I would say some of them irreversible, they are here now. 
and the wildfires of 2020 have been repeated throughout the globe in 2021. Last week, we got the IPCC report. It tells us how extreme weather, heat waves, torrential rains, droughts, storms, wildfires, it will become ever more common. My fourth example, violence, conflict, instability, it never went away. Its horrific effects are seen with full force in Ethiopia, in Syria, in Afghanistan and Myanmar, just to mention four concrete examples. And of course, the fifth is the pandemic. And just to try to underline the kind of complexity this portrays, all of these examples often work together in the most destructive of ways. And in Afghanistan, even before the very dramatic events of last week, we have seen how violence combined with drought has made refugees out of hundreds of thousands of people. We see how this provides the ideal conditions for the pandemic to spread. And we see how great power rivalry can very often complicate finding a resolute response from the international community, including through our seat in the UN Security Council. Together with Estonia, we are pen holders for Afghanistan, meaning that we hold a special responsibility uh, for that. And we called an emergency meeting yesterday. Uh, and I'm very glad to say that that meeting produced uh, also a very, a very joint message uh, to the Taliban about the situation. Uh, and I'm very glad that we could call that meeting uh, so quickly. So in order to assist uh, a recovery in such a very messy, complex context, I think that there are a number of reminders that are important. And let me mention three here. The first one is that even in a very I say, crowded field of foreign policy challenges, a necessary foreign policy move is to just keep reminding ourselves that this is not only about foreign policy. Uh, I do believe that a solid domestic platform is a precondition for an effective foreign policy. And investment in human capital, in research and development, in education and safety nets is actually a key. So in short, uh, you can say that building very good, resilient societies that cannot just withstand an open economy, but, but thrive in it is where we are heading. Industrial policy and stronger state intervention in the economy appears to be making a little bit of a comeback. And for the most part, I think we can expect that this rests on good intentions. And, and hopefully the benign side of this can revitalize economies and, and be part of, of building back better and greener after, after the pandemic. I do think that the um, European Green Deal, which also provides massive opportunities for Norwegian companies, is a prime example of this. But on the other hand, we should also keep in the back of our minds that the road to protectionism is very often paved with the same good intentions. It is about creating and protecting jobs and about avoiding vulnerability. And the nuance, of course, in this is how we expend our efforts. Are we working hard for our own improvement or are we working on putting up barriers for our competitors? Because protectionism and economic self-reliance have been tried and it has failed. And I think it's a mistake too costly to repeat. The second reminder is that we should not underestimate our interest in other success. Interdependence and, and shared cross-border challenges means that I don't win by you losing. I would say on the contrary. And vaccines is an obvious example. The IMF has estimated that spending a mere $50 billion on an international vaccine plan can provide gains of $9 trillion. And as Martin Wolf of, of the Financial Times, he, he had a quote saying that this must be among the highest return investments ever. And the Act A partnership that many of you know and its COVAX facility is really fundamental in ensuring that, that all countries are included in our common fight to stop the pandemic. Norway fully supports this effort and including also by, by co-chairing the facilitation council of the, the ACT Accelerator. We do this together with South Africa. 
uh, we have contributed more than 4.5 billion Norwegian krona, meaning around 500 million dollars. For us, this is both an economic and a moral imperative. And thirdly, um, we must ensure that not everything we do becomes sucked into the geopolitical rivalry. Some issues will have strategic importance, it will have security implications, but many will not. And while the prospect of great power rivalry will always be worrisome, I am also encouraged by the new US administration and how they acknowledge the need to compartmentalize their policy towards China. And of course, some aspects of the US-China relation will be adversarial and others will be competitive. But actually, a great number of issues, uh, the relationship can and must be cooperative. You probably heard the US climate envoy, uh, John Kerry, being very clear on this. He says that climate change is a freestanding international crisis, which all of us needs to deal with, regardless of any potential rivalry. And, and putting that into practice, it involves extreme caution in making linkages between issues across the adversarial, competitive and, and cooperative categories. And a real test of the ability to achieve this will, of course, arrive very soon in Glasgow this autumn during COP26. Well, I also believe that we should be working towards a list of cooperative issues that is considerably longer than climate change. And whether on keeping trade open and, and rules based, whether on pandemic response, on a number of situations on the Security Council agenda where violence and humanitarian disaster threaten, the international community just has to come together in a cooperative fashion. Ladies and gentlemen in Arndal, uh, in, in the economic field, the, the recovery after World War II was built on institutions, including the International Monetary Fund and the precursors to the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. And as all of you remember, these institutions were built on solidarity, on rules, and also on a clear ideological belief. Namely, that non-discrimination, open markets and economic opportunities for all peoples would help build not just a more prosperous, but also a more secure world. And recovery will fail if we try to do it alone, in isolation. And the pandemic is providing the world also with some valuable lessons. And one is of the remarkable capacity of humanity. I mean, despite all the suffering and all the challenges the pandemic still brings, at no point before now in the history of the human race have we had the capability to meet a pandemic with a vaccine response this quickly and of this magnitude. And to the extent that we're not succeeding, it is due to a failure of politics, not our capability. And politics is when it comes down to it, human choices, and I believe choices will eventually bend to reason if reason is persistently presented. The other lesson lies within the slogan that we've all heard and many of us repeated, no one is safe until everyone's safe. And we just have to deliver on this insight as well as bring it with us to other fields as well, because it is actually much broader and your economic growth helps me grow. Your wealth keeps me healthy and your security keeps me secure. And that actually brings us some hope. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention. I have to say, I envy you the ability to be physically present in Arndal. Uh, and I really hope that the opportunity comes again for a new physical Arndal Suka next year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. As always, you provide very insightful and at the same time frank assessment. There is much to be alarmed about, and yet there is much to be hopeful about, as you rightly said. Um, so I just wanted to ask you something about Afghanistan. Um, a lot of people say that it, the way the pullout happened from 
Kabul, the way the withdrawal happened from Kabul, it could have been organized better. Independent experts, both in Washington and London, say that there is no elegant way of losing a war. What do you say? Well, that's really uh, quite a big question, Anita. And I think um, I think it's a bit too soon to say um, exactly how things could have been done in a different way. Um, when the decision was made in NATO to withdraw, uh, I said very clearly in the NATO meeting, and I've, I've repeated that later on as well, that we are only left with bad options. All of them have negative consequences. Uh, and I think what is unfolding in Afghanistan uh, is really a proof to that, that we, we are left with very difficult choices. Um, the, we, we had to make a choice at one point. Uh, and I think what has been surprising to almost everyone is not only the fact that uh, the Taliban were able to uh, take over many cities and provincial capitals so quickly, but also the extent of, of their overtaking. Uh, I don't think anyone was surprised by the fact that it would be a power struggle but the, the intensity, the pace and the scale has been surprising to, to everyone. So that is why our focus is now solely on, uh, on the evacuation of, of our local employees and their families and to make sure that, that they are safe. So we have two questions from the audience. One is, has the United States given Afghanistan on a platter to China? That's one question. And the second question is, do you see Norway playing a role in mediating between the United States and China? Well, to the first question, um, whether the U.S. has delivered Afghanistan on a platter to China, I, I think that what we are seeing right now is, of course, a very difficult and volatile situation. We have been asking for a long time for countries in the region to assume a greater responsibility for the development of Afghanistan. And the next days and weeks will determine how the international community will relate to and work with the eventual new leadership in Afghanistan, whether it is now a de facto, uh, a de facto transfer of power through what has happened over the last days, or if there will be negotiations of some kind of, of power sharing uh, in the wake of what has happened. Uh, our intention, of course, is to as of now, continue to help Afghans, especially in the humanitarian field. Um, you probably already know this, but Afghanistan is one of our biggest recipients of aid, and humanitarian aid included, uh, because the needs are, are so dire. But it is, of course, also um, uh, the Afghans who need to, to carve out a path for the future and also engage with countries. But as I said, I think what the Taliban does over the next uh, days and weeks will determine a lot on what that roadmap looks like and which countries are uh, gaining more influence uh, in Afghanistan. You mentioned and about the... the question. Uh, so, oh, yeah, sorry. The, sorry, the second yeah. question about yeah. uh, Norway playing a role. <laughs> well... Our role when we act as mediators is to act as mediators in conflict situation when the parties ask us to do so. Uh, we are, as probably many of you have seen, uh, very heavily engaged right now in Venezuela uh, at the request of the parties uh, and also with a long history before we came to Mexico now with several attempts and also uh, a long history of facilitating and trying to build trust between the parties in order to get them to the table. That is not the situation that the US and China has. Uh, and uh, I'm absolutely confident that they are fully able to uh, find uh, good ways of working together on areas where they have joint interest or where they see that that cooperation is necessary of other reasons as well. Uh, but as I said, their relationship will be, I would say, many faceted because they, they will have adversarial uh, parts of it. They will have competition, but they will, they will also have areas of, of cooperation. The last question. You mentioned the great power rivalry is back. Do you think the United States is replacing its wars in Afghanistan and the Middle East with a contest with China, but framing it ideologically, autocracy versus democracy? And while autocracy has no place in the 21st century, history teaches us that ideology has a bad habit of leading to wars. Yeah. Well, I, I, as I said in, in my introduction, I quite encouraged by the new Biden administration and their um, ability to, in a way, 
put the relationship with China in different boxes. Um, and it seems like this is more of a feature now than it was during the Trump administration. Keeping in mind, though, that um, the rivalry with between the U.S. and China is of a deep strategic nature. It is not only about trade tariffs. It is not only about uh, the influence uh, in, in certain regions of the world. It is a deep strategic competition. And we are dealing here with a, a China that is the world's second largest military power, the world's second largest economy. And that is why not only the U.S., but also NATO and others need to reflect on the consequences of the rise of China. And in, in our mind, that does not mean necessarily only a rivalry or only uh, an adversarial uh, approach. On the contrary, we try to find uh, areas to cooperate where it is of joint interest or where China is a key actor to make progress happen on the ground. And uh, I do not necessarily think that the approach of the U.S. to this uh, right now is replacing, in a way, one uh, war or one engagement with, with another. Uh, this goes quite a long, uh, it dates back quite long, and, and I think we will see the different aspects of the U.S.-China relationship unfolding also in the future. But great power rivalry is always worrisome uh, because it does not serve the interest of the rest of the countries, uh, be them small or big, when you have a great power rivalry that has a tendency to, to overshadow a lot of the potential possibilities for cooperation on major issues. Thank you so much. We really miss seeing you in person, but thank you for taking the time and finding the time to be with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anita. Our next keynote speaker, Nikolai Tangan, needs no introduction. In fact, he became even more famous before he took up the job as the CEO of Nor Norway's oil fund, which at over $1.3 trillion is the world's largest sovereign wealth fund and invested in some 9,000 companies in 73 countries. His comments can take the market up or down, which is why he wisely does not say very much except for a recent bombshell interview. But he, his, um, he is watched very closely, not only in Norway, but around the world. And in turn, Nikolai Tangen is watching the, what is happening in the world very closely. And he's noticing something. He is noticing a change, a change that can impact recovery. Here is Nikolai Tangan talking to us on, is capitalism changing? Thank you. Well, in a session where we look into the future, I can think of no more interesting than to look into the future of capitalism, because it is now changing very, very fast. And if you search the future of capitalism on Google, you get 57 million hits because there are a lot of academic articles about it, a lot of books written about it, and of course, therefore, it's with a lot of humility that, uh, that I'm going to, to talk about it. At the same time, as the CEO of the world's largest individual investor, I do think we have some insights into the face of um, capitalism. As a nation, capitalism has served us extremely well. We have now values of more than 12,000 billion Norwegian crowns invested globally in companies which have given us tremendous returns. And today, my starting point will be what we are actually observing in the market. We own, on average, roughly 1.5% of all listed companies in the world, and in Europe, it's close to 3%. We therefore have some kind of front row seat to see what's changing now. But first, some introductory remarks about capitalism. It's very efficient. It generates results quickly. We are not talking seconds, we are talking milliseconds before we see changes in values and so on. Capitalism is crucial for our modern society for the resource allocation, production, pricing, technological development, and so on, and it provides opportunities for companies to grow. 
it has certainly proven to be a lot more viable and robust than anybody ever thought. It has survived crises, wars, pandemics, and has also survived alternative ideologies such as communism. And I think capitalism will continue to dominate our economic system also in the future. But there is another side to capitalism because it has a lot of inherent weaknesses. A well-functioning capitalism system depends on regulatory authorities and that they ensure stable conditions. We in the oil fund are a very experienced investor in 70 different markets and we regularly give input into um, uh, various regulatory authorities. Now, these are not political views. They are views about how you can make markets function even better and how we can make sure that people have proper trust in the markets. The market cannot price everything. So companies can inflict major indirect costs upon the environment and society as a whole without these costs being priced in. And we see this most clearly now in the long-term climate situation and the change. And in the fund, we work very hard on quantifying these negative externalities, which is what we call them, i.e. the negative aspects of how companies conduct themselves and how they operate. And that way, the market can kind of price indirectly the cost of products and services better. And one example here, of course, is carbon pricing, which pushes the cost of emissions over to the people who actually make them. Here, the companies have responsibility, but it's obvious that they don't operate in isolation. Therefore, they depend on regulatory authorities and a well-functioning market. And that brings me to today's topic. What I believe is that we are now seeing an important extension of capitalism. We are now seeing a new focus on company purpose. The companies form the basis of capitalism. The companies that will survive in the long term can no longer think about the short term only. And we have seen an increasing interest from companies recently in defining their purpose and basing their strategy on this purpose. And that trend reflects discussions amongst policymakers, company executives, and academics. How can companies serve their many stakeholders? How could a clearer sense of purpose help them to create more value in the long term? The world's largest asset manager, BlackRock, and its CEO, Larry Fink, in 2019, wrote a letter to you know, all the companies and asked them to define their purpose. And in an, as an investor, we really, really welcome this development and this discussion. We support companies to define their purpose and reflect on their contribution to society. But for a purpose to be truly meaningful, it also needs to translate into culture, strategy, the targets, and the actions that they have. Only then will the corporate purpose be more than just words. And we believe that such a purpose actually can be profit-enhancing and support corporate social and environmental objectives at the same time. Because companies do not operate in isolation. They interact with society. And they exist because society has given them some kind of license to operate. And for this license to work, society must see the existence of companies as a benefit. Some would argue that corporates are too focused on short-term results at the expense of long-term value creation. This phenomenon is described as management myopia or short-termness, like short-sightedness. And some of that, of course, is explained by, by legal uh, reasons, by remuneration structures and corporate earnings releases. A corporate purpose can help reorientate decision-making towards the longer term by giving a clear sense of direction. Very interestingly, a PwC study recently 
found that 90% of millennials, i.e. the young generation, want to work for a company who has values which reflect their own values. And so in this sense, declaring a purpose as a company help protect and develop the human capital. And this, again, can increase employee efficiency. To put it in other words, a purpose can give employees an extra drive, you know, some kind of rocket. As a leader of a fund investing for the benefit of future generations of Norwegians, I fully support that. To earn money for the benefit of our society as a key motivation for everybody who works in the oil fund, and that is why we go to work every day. A clearly defined purpose may also help investors understand the company's strategy and assess how it is implemented. For this information to be meaningful, companies need to translate the purpose into cultural targets, I'm sorry, into culture, targets, actions, and how they report. At the same time, the, perp the um, Company, the company purpose must not create unrealistic expectations towards the company, because companies alone cannot correct market failures. It's important that companies do not have trade-offs between multiple purposes, and the same goes for the oil fund. If a company has multiple purposes of targets, there is an increased risk of not reaching them. With that said, we believe that a well-defined purpose can lead to better outcomes. Companies depend on sustainable business model and cannot operate based on quarterly results. This, in a sense, proves that capitalism is changing. And now I will talk about ownership and give you the really up-to-date numbers. 2020 was a very challenging year for companies, as we all know. But we saw many companies maintain and even increase the focus on sustainability. Proactive measures by individual companies are very good to see and is part of a development that we now have seen for several years. In the oil fund, we are number geeks. We put numbers on everything we do. And so prior to this conference today, we checked how often our portfolio managers who are the people who actually talk to the companies, just what they talk about and how we measure the dynamics of capitalism. And our analysis shows that in 2020, we used the word capitalism in our company meetings 3,300 times, a five-fold increase since 2012, showing how the focus of conversations are changing. We see a similar trend for climate. Last year, it was mentioned in 2,500 conversations we have, compared to only 150 times in 2013. So from 150 to 2,500 times. When we see what a virus can do with the world, imagine what the climate can do. As an investor, we see four trends related to how companies and investors have changed their focus. The first as an increased focus on the board's role to set strategy and follow up with management. The board's role has become more important and shareholders steadily ask much more of the board and the board members. And I think we are likely to see shareholders raise their requirements for electing board members going forward. Investors like us, invested in thousands of companies, need effective boards to set the direction and to follow up with the management teams. We vote against company boards when they clearly lack behind, I'm sorry, when they lag behind in, for example, the work they do on climate. Meaning companies where we see that there are not enough effort being put into low carbon society or where they're not interested to have a, li a dialogue on this topic. Secondly, we also see a much stronger shareholder democracy. US shareholders, have increased their influence by so-called shareholder proposals, which is proposals that shareholders have at their yearly annual meetings. At the same time, more companies split the role of the CEO and the chairman or chairperson, a position that in many companies are still held by the same person. Splitting that position 
has been a long-term trend, and it is a very positive trend as a chair should oversee management, and we therefore for many years have advocated this split. We also see that shareholder resolutions get more and more traction when it comes to support from other shareholders. Interestingly, in 2021, shareholder resolutions on sustainability received 33% votes in favor, compared to only 16% in 2012. So this has more than doubled. 37 suggestions received a majority vote in 2021 and were adopted. In 2012, none of the shareholder proposals received a majority vote. This is a huge change. The third element is that we see an increasing expectation towards shareholders to use their ownership to influence companies. A good example here is CEO remuneration. The so-called say-on-pay arrangement gives shareholders in some countries a right or a duty to consider executive pay and express their views by voting. In most developed markets, companies put forward remuneration plans and report on the payments. Votes against remuneration schemes have gradually increased, but unfortunately at the same time, the aggregated remuneration has continued to increase. 48 CEO remuneration plans did not receive a majority during the first half this year, and this has doubled from last year. So shareholders are becoming much more vocal than we have ever seen them in the past. We argue that, CEOs, that, that the CEO should be given incentives to create long-term value for the company. Remuneration plans should be really, really long-term, include a substantial equity component with lengthy locker periods of five to 10 years. We hold the board accountable for how they follow up on these plans. And lastly, we see, as I explained above, an increased focus on the company's role in society and an increased acknowledgement that companies have numerous stakeholders. To conclude, all these observations build on my thesis that how the companies interact and what we expect of them are evolving. And in this way, the cornerstone of capitalism itself is changing. For us, as long-term owners, it is therefore very clear that we need to follow this trend very closely and actively engage with the companies we own. And only then can we fulfill our mandate and continue to increase wealth for future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much for, first of all, raising a defining question of our times, is capitalism changing? And then giving us some very thought-provoking answers. Thank you so much. Um, you know, in the 2008 financial crisis, governments imposed austerity and inflicted social pain and, on the society, which had a lot of political consequences. This time round, governments are paying their way out of the pandemic. And uh, so there is social peace. But could the result of this be debt, deficit, inflation, and what could the con uh, consequences of that be? Yeah, well, that's a, <laughs> that's a very good and topical question. Um, I think probably inflation is the biggest uh, threat to capital markets that we are seeing now. Um, we are seeing inflation in a lot of different places, in freight rates, uh, raw materials, minimum wages. Uh, we see it pretty much across the board. And the bad news with inflation is that um, it will probably hit the portfolio in a way that we have not seen before, because it would impact our bond portfolio and the equity portfolio at the same time. Um, so we could see, uh, you know, an effect of the portfolio, a decline in the portfolio that we haven't seen before, and it, and it can be more lasting than what we have seen in the past. Which would then mean that the government would have to be very tight-fisted with their budgets. Yeah, so the good thing with the Norwegian model is that uh, I'm in charge of, uh, uh, we are in charge of making money, and the government is in charge of spending the money. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I never comment on spending. Oh, oh I see, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Going to, um, you know, the American economist, very famous American economist, uh, Hyman Minsky, he said that uh, capitalism, one of the serious flaws in capitalism is the 
periodic or systemic or cyclical uh, financial instability. Um, is there any way of cushioning these swings that happen because what governments and people need is predictability in their lives? Uh, no, I, uh, I don't think so. I think we will have uh, huge swings uh, also in the future. Um, I think what is different now is that um, since the financial crisis, the financial institutions are more solid, and so they should uh, you know, get through it uh, in a better way. But we will see you know, a continuation of uh, greed and fear and ups and downs. Now, the good news uh, is that we in the oil fund can take advantage of these opportunities, right? Ah, okay, so there's opportunities even in these things. Always opportunities in the markets. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question from the audience. The age of robotics has started. If you put on your long-term glasses, what do you see? Um, well, what I see, I see uh, clearly uh, uh, an increased uh, importance of artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on. We are using that several places in the oil fund, um, but that's probably something that will just increase. Um, how do you envisage your role in the fight against climate change as the head of the largest fund of the world? Yeah. Now, what's happening on Friday this week is that the uh, Skanke Utvalge will uh, present and announce what they think we should be doing uh, in the oil fund, and we would also present what, what our thoughts are. So I think uh, stay tuned for Friday. <laughs> okay. So... In the debate on these natural resources, whether it's a blessing or a curse, uh, uh, most people find that at least, at least Norway is a blessing, that's for sure. And, and the fund is the you know, integral part in this. How, what is it about the fund's model that makes it work? Yeah, um, you know, we just celebrated the 25th uh, anniversary yeah, of the fund. That's right. And uh, it's one of the biggest success, success stories of, of the history of this country. Um, it's um, based on a very, very deep uh, political anchoring, broad ownership amongst the political parties, uh, really proper long-term thinking, uh, two great uh, CEOs uh, who were before me, and tomorrow evening you can see the two of them and me in a discussion at the Tov Senen uh, in the evening. Um, and we should not forget, we have been a tiny bit lucky too, because, because capital markets have been increasing you know, now for pretty much 25 years. And that's never a bad thing if you try to build wealth. Mm -hmm. How much power does the fund have in uh, reforming companies? Yeah. So I, I don't think it has real power, but it does have influence. And um, we use that influence in several ways. But one of the most important things is that we vote at the, the annual shareholder meeting. So if you are a listed company, you have once a year, the shareholders can come and they vote for various proposals. And um, earlier on this year, we for the first time started to announce our voting intentions five, day, five days ahead of the AGMs so that every other investor in the world can see how the Norwegian oil fund is voting on these various proposals. And that is important, I think. Yeah, we've got many more questions, but unfortunately, time is running out. So thank you so much, Nicola. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next keynote speaker could be a future British Prime Minister. Does he want to? Nobody knows for sure. And that, of course, only increases his appeal. Tom Tugendhat is the Tory chair of UK's uh, Foreign Relations Committee, and he has actively, proactively, and in a non-partisan way, that is uh, bringing in uh, both the Tory as well as uh, Labour MPs, he has contributed to shaping Britain's foreign policy. He is tough on Russia when it comes to issues like uh, corruption. He's tough on China when it comes to human rights and uh, democracy. And uh, China, of course, uh, dismisses his work as disinformation. Tom is also very active in the climate debate. Here he is talking to us on towards a greener but more insecure future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for welcoming me here in Arundel. The person who is most uh, disappointed not to have come with me, of course, is my daughter, who has spent the last two weeks telling me that I've got to meet Princess Elsa while I'm here. <laughs> I haven't met Princess Elsa, 
I'm sorry to announce. I don't think she's watching, so I think I can say it safely. But I have met the most extraordinary group of people, Norwegian politicians and think tankers, activists and investors, who have given me an eye into many of the ways in which people in this part of the world are thinking about our future. But I thought perhaps it would be interesting for you if I were to talk about how I see some of the challenges that we face. Because this last week has been dominated by a fundamental change in one of Britain's major foreign policy exercises. I'm, of course, I'm referring to the war in Afghanistan, to the support to the Afghan government, and now, tragically, to the catastrophe that is Kabul. I thought I'd touch on a few things there. The first is the question of reliance. The reliance that we see of the Afghan forces on us, on the United States, and on others. And that over-reliance is not the same as interdependence. Now, many of you will already be way ahead of me and realize where I'm going with this argument. That our own interdependence may also become over-reliance. A decision taken in Washington with little consultation has led to the single greatest foreign policy disaster the UK has had since Suez. This is a hell of a blow. It's a hell of a blow. The next element, though, is to look at the adaptability. The adaptability that we're now going to have to demonstrate in order to recover from this huge change. Because what this has done, it hasn't just challenged our military. It hasn't just challenged our strength. What it's done is it's called into question the trust that people feel in us and the confidence that people have for the future. And that's where I'm going to come on to the question that you actually asked me, which is to talk about a greener future. Because quite a lot of the debate that we've been having over the last few years is catastrophic. We're all dead in a few years if we don't do this. We'll all boil in a few years if we don't do that. And in doing that, what we're doing is we're reducing people's ability to think clearly about the options we can take. That doesn't mean we should hide the facts, but it does mean we should focus on what we can achieve. And here the lessons come back together. Because the reality is, like in the global environment that we find in Afghanistan or around the world, there is nothing that we can truly do alone. Over the next two or three decades, we are going to have to make some very fundamental changes to our lives. The decisions that shape them will be taken in the coming years, but the effects will run over much longer time periods. And those decisions, those actions, will not work if we work alone. So the key lesson from us, for us today, as it is in Afghanistan, is interdependence. But why do I not say, why do I come back to the question of over-reliance? We cannot have the decisions, the futures of people around the world entirely dependent on the decisions of a very, very few people. We need to remove, as much as possible, the single point of failure that any helicopter pilot will know is what makes you truly nervous. But there are lessons on how we can build this interdependence stronger. There are lessons because the way we constructed the post-war world 
teaches us that there are ways of making intergovernmental, interpopular conversations work. They're not perfect, they're hard, they require compromise, they limit our individual agency ability to act. But I would argue they expand our sovereignty, they confirm our future, they strengthen our existence. And that's by talking about the kind of bodies that we built up. Economically, we built GATS, the World Trade Organization, as it now is. We built the IMF, we built the World Bank. We built NATO. We built EFTA, the EU, the African Union. Many, many different organizations that demonstrated that cooperation even if you're not a member of all of them, cooperation can achieve so much more. But there are real challenges today that are not just about single points of failure in decisions in Afghanistan, but are challenges to the very systems that we have built and that we will need in order to address the climate challenges that we face. And here I want to talk about China, particularly. Because many of you may have heard, I have been very critical of the human rights violations that we've seen of the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. I've commented very clearly, I hope, on the abuse of democracy and freedoms in Hong Kong. I've com commented very clearly, I hope, on the fact that though China is an essential partner to all of us, with a culture, a history, a people who understand fully what democracy is, know exactly what opportunity is, and demonstrate it every day in states like Taiwan, what the Chinese Communist Party is threatening us all with is much more severe than I think many people realize. And it's more severe because it's not just a today challenge. It's a future challenge. What they're doing is they're trying to replace the system that we have built carefully, deliberately, cooperatively, over 70, 80 years, Yes, with failures. Yes, with obstacles. And yes, with many, many adaptations. But they're trying to replace it, that networked world, that interdependence without over-reliance, with single point of failure, authoritarian centralism. That is dangerous for all of us. Perhaps most obviously it's dangerous for the Chinese people. Because what we're seeing, if we go back to climate change, is we're seeing the same challenges that we talk about here, writ large, in that extraordinary and wonderful country. We're seeing the expansion of desertification in the north. We're seeing the salination of the fields in the southeast. We're seeing real, present challenges to a country that is trying to govern 1.3, 1.4 billion people. That's not good for any of us. We all need China to succeed. We all need each other to succeed because that interdependence, that cooperation is the only way that we're going to achieve success in the challenges that we face today. It's not enough to say that countries are far away. When our Prime Minister in 1938 said that the Czech people lived in a faraway country about which we knew little, we paid the price. When our generals said that Afghanistan was too difficult, too distant, in the late 90s, we paid a price. And today, if we have that same attitude 
to the actions of mass emitters, we will pay a price. So it is not enough, I'm afraid, for us to be buying our electric cars and exporting the pollution. It's not enough for us to be cleaning up our act at home and pretending that we're not dependent on each other. There is a danger here that we forget the lessons that we see elsewhere and think they only apply to one theatre. They don't. They apply all over. But I think there's a huge opportunity. As I saw by the port this morning, a man knitting fishing nets in a way that I don't think I've seen ever before. I'm reminded that interdependence is the nature of human existence. What we need to do is find ways to talk to each other, to expand it, and to make sure that interdependence, not over-reliance, is the way we govern ourselves for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. As always, in 12 minutes, you cover civilization. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a very simple question to ask. You know, Americans are, have some of the brightest people on the planet, everywhere, across the board, the establishment from you know, policymakers, decision makers, diplomats, intelligence, military officials. Why do they still get it wrong? It's hard to answer that politely. Uh, <laughs> Don't be polite. You're in Andalzuka now. Uh, look, hope is a very powerful emotion. Uh, and for many of us, hope can overtake the reality of the information we're getting. Because the urgency of hope leads many people, all of us, me, to think, you know what, I might just get away with it. The urgency of this situation leads me to take a risk and to rely on hope. But the reality is we've got to be focused on what the risks really are. And I think for a long time, and this is possibly the nature of the luxury that we've had as humans for the last, well, Western European humans for the last 70, 80 years, we've lived in a very, very safe climate in a very safe community, proportionately. Very few of us have seen occupying armies invade our homes. Very few of us have had to fight for our values or for our families. And I think that has led to a failure to understand the real risks that we face as a world and that we face as individuals. And that, I think, has led to an excess of hope and an under-representation of caution. <laughs> Very true. Uh, we have an audience question. How do you see Norway-UK relations moving forward in the 2020s? Well, I hope very closely. I mean, the reason I'm here uh, today is not just to make my daughter jealous, but to, <laughs> but to talk to people from all political sides and from none here in Norway, because I think the relationship between our two countries has improved a lot in the last 1,200 years since you stopped murdering us. Um, <laughs> for which I'm very grateful, by the way. <laughs> and I think that, funnily enough, we are actually quite similar countries. We may not think of it, but we're both very maritime. We're both very international. We both have a very large neighbour who we try to influence and find difficult. <laughs> we also have very strong similar views about the idea that we are communities, but we believe in liberty, that we believe in enterprise, but we also believe in responsibility. So I think there is a lot of overlap between our countries, and the conversations we need to be having are how do we make sure that Doggerland, that bit of sea that we now call the North Sea between us, becomes a bridge again, as it was before climate change about 10,000, 12,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that climate is now what's rocketing, fueling your economy, and by the way, heating our homes. But it's also 
a reminder of the living bridge between our peoples. You know, we're, there is a fundamental connection between us. Um, do we have... Okay. The Singaporean leader, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, he said that... Uh, all China wants is to be co-equal with the United States. China is not interested in being an honorary member of the West. Why should China play by the West rules? Well, because they're not the West rules. The rules that we're, or that I and others are asking China to abide by, are not my rules. I didn't write the United Nations declarations on human rights. I wasn't born. In fact, my father wasn't born. They were written by P.C. Chang, a Chinese diplomat. And they injected Confucian ideas of rights, of family, of community, of freedom into the UN Charter and onto us. These are Chinese rules. They're not communist rules, true. They're not communist rules. They're not dictatorial rules, that's also true, they're not. But they are Chinese. These are not Western values. These are universal values. The idea that people in China do not understand democracy is completely invalidated by the existence of Taiwan. The idea that people in China don't value liberty is completely invalidated by the number of people who constantly strive to get to America or to Britain. In fact, I was in the last time, probably the last time for many years, that I will be allowed to go to China. I was there few years ago, and I asked a very, very wealthy uh, businessman what his single greatest luxury would be. What would he like to have? What would, be his, what would it be that really made him feel that he'd really arrived? And I thought he was going to say a Ferrari or a... Fish and chips. Oh, well, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> or a beach house in Macau. And do you know what he said? He said an American passport. Uh, I think that tells you all. Yes. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. And judging by the audience applause, <laughs> judging by our audience applause, if they had a vote in UK, you would be Prime Minister. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice. Thank you. So now we will go in for our panel discussion. And uh, may I request the panel panelists to please come on stage? And while they take their position, could I please remind you that uh, uh, you can send in your questions to uh, menti.com to the uh, the phone number? No, not phone number. The code. I don't have it here with me. The code. Can we have the code on the screen? Um, and then just uh, send in your uh, questions addressed to the person concerned. What's happened to our panel? Will our panel come on stage? Yes, please do. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So as you can see, a very high-powered panel. So I don't need to really uh, spend much time introducing them. Everyone knows them. I'll be very, very brief. So on the extreme left, we have uh, Yoon Gunnar Pedersen. He's a brilliant financier and uh, former deputy minister. He was the chair of the government-appointed commission to assess Norway's post-pandemic economy. So after, when his turn comes, we will request him to give us his entire commission's findings in a soundbite. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and then we have uh, Hilda Meretta Osheim. She is the president and CEO of uh, Hydro. She took that job just a few months before the pandemic struck. She has also been the uh, head of the Federation of Norwegian Industries. So she brings a really broad industry perspective. And uh, then we have uh, Bjorn Otto Swedrup. He is the uh, chair of the um, executive committee of the OGCI. It's called, uh, and that stands for Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. Um, it is a CEO-led initiative to accelerate the industry's response to climate change. Good luck. <laughs> and he has an, I, I hope he's the right person because he has an identical twin. And then we have Ivan Eriksson. He, uh, he is the president and CEO of Acker. He has experience in 
Actually, it'll be easier for me to say what he does not have experience in because the list is so long. So let me just try. So he has experience in shipping and finance and uh, fisheries and uh, asset management, offshore uh, drilling, media, trade, industry. How can anyone keep so much experience in one head? It's really remarkable. So. Uh, Yoon Gunnar, if I could start with you, can you give us, tell us when and how recovery will happen, some broad international trends uh, and uh, Norway's economy post-pandemic? Well, for many industries and probably most of the economy in Norway, recovery has already happened. Many industries uh, are faring better and did fare better through the pandemic than they did before. There are several industries which are lagging, and many will take many years to recover. But overall, the turnaround is quite swift. And part of the reason is that this was a pandemic, this was, an, uh, this was, this was, a, this was a crisis, which was caused not by imbalances, fundamental imbalances in the economy before the pandemic struck. This was a crisis which was caused by an illness, by a, by a virus. So unlike previous financial crises, once the pandemic is under control, returning to a balanced economy should be more swift. And what would be some of the broad international trends, you think, post-pandemic? Well, many of those trends will be quite beneficial to Norway, because some of the industries in which we are engaged, industries like shipping, like building things which need to float in the ocean, like seafood, uh, like uh, the uh, hydropower industry, like the ammonia. These are industries which are being lifted not only by the recovery, but also by the fundamental trends uh, which uh, have, were discussed in the previous, dis uh, previous presentations. The shift towards a more sustainable economy uh, is, uh, is a shift which, gear, uh, which Norway is well geared for. Hmm. Hilda. Uh, will the green shift accelerate or slow down recovery? Well, um, I'm proud to represent uh, Hydro in this audience, um, a company that has been around for 115 years. With uh, Tangen was talking about the purpose. So we have had, we have had the purpose of creating viable societies, producing products and solutions uh, uh, that, that the world needs in a responsible way. Today, Hydro is an energy and aluminium company, and. Um, uh, I see that uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the the trend is towards um, uh, towards the, the to produce products and solution uh, with uh, a low carbon uh, footprint. And uh, and um, today, uh, aluminium is uh, is defined as a strategic material in uh, in EU uh, to. Uh, to achieve the climate target uh, within EU, which is about reducing emissions from the transport sector, it's about uh, improving uh, uh, energy efficiency from buildings, it's about also to accelerate the recycling and circle an economy. And uh, this is the per perfect match for aluminium. Uh, and we see that uh, the demand for aluminium is increasing uh, due to, uh, due to uh, the fact that aluminium can be um, an enabler as a uh, part of the solution. And so uh, we are quite um, enthusiastic about the, uh, the acceleration of, uh, of, of recovery in terms of demand for aluminium. And uh, that is also our strategy to uh, continue to strengthen our low carbon aluminium, um, simply because we produce um, aluminium based on renewable power, in, especially in Norway. Uh, with um, um, a carbon footprint which is 75% uh, lower uh, than the rest of the industry. So we are, we are well positioned to, um, to accelerate uh, in, the, in, uh, in the green transition. Right. Uh, Bjorn Otto, um, greenwashing. <coughs> there is a popular perception that oil and gas sector is just indulging in uh, greenwashing and just uh, getting a nice slice of the green investments, uh, and at the same time lobbying, and this is of course international companies, uh, lobbying their governments for you know, no regulation, don't want even climate risk disclosures. Can the oil and gas companies change structurally to respond to climate cri uh, crisis? Yeah, I think that's the fundamentally important question. So 
I guess people have a plenty of reasons to be a bit reluctant to accept everything they're seeing, but the question is, is there a profound change on the way? <clears throat> when you're talking about financial recovery, I think that recovery is already taking place. Mm -hmm. You know, oil prices going from 10 to $75. All the companies are already in the profits. But the big question is, it's not about recovery, it's, it's about transition. Because given climate, two-thirds of all climate emissions are related to the use of energy. So this industry don't need to get back to where it was. It needs to really undergo a profound change. And the question is, are we seeing indications that the companies are changing? And I think if you're looking closely, you'll see that most of the major companies are now seeing themselves as energy companies, not just pure play, oil and gas. They're allocating more investments into renewables. They are, if you look at world spending, there are less exploration for new oil and gas activities. Less companies are concerned about guiding production growth. So there's quite a lot of indications, but of course we need to do much more. And in OGCI, which includes both the American oil and gas companies, but also Saudi Arabia and Saudi Aramco and the Chinese, we have set this challenge, it's a one gigaton challenge, to eliminate all the emissions from the, uh, their own operations. It's a huge number. It's, it's uh, like the combined emissions of all airplanes in the world. And then it's the four gigaton challenge to clean up the entire oil and gas industry, basically to eliminate 10% of the world's total emissions. And then in the longer term, it's the 20 gigaton challenge to help society decarbonize. And I think this industry has a role to play in that. Right. Um, Eivind, what is your pathway to recovery? Uh, it's like you are sitting on two stools, uh, Akaris, uh, that is on the one side very involved in the oil and gas sector, and on the other side also extremely uh, involved in the renewable energy sector. This is a bit like Ole Brom, you know, yes, both please. <laughs> uh, but going forward, in view of the IEA report which says that companies should no longer invest in uh, oil and gas, what do you see as the future of the oil and gas sector? Well, we all appreciate the fact that the recovery has started, but we shouldn't take it for granted, because in significant parts of the world, the situation is still serious. And hence, uh, we as business leaders have to prepare ourselves for continued uh, volatility and downside risk. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as far as the recovery concern, um, uh, we in ARCA believe that it will um, um, be built on uh, global trajectories, which were started long before the lockdown. One is um, an increased demand for energy. Um, uh, uh, the second is um, a strong drive towards decarbonisation and renewable energy. The third uh, trajectory uh, is um, industrial um, uh, software and digitalization. And last but not the least, um, uh, more and more focus on health and healthy living. And <clears throat> um, uh, it's true that uh, we are sitting on actually more than two stools. Uh, uh, but in energy, uh, we have Aqua BP with a portfolio which will double during the course of the next few years. Um, and RKPP will play a, an important role in the long-term development and uh, transition of the ARCA Group, both as um, uh, a source of funding, but also as a source of competency and technology. In um, uh, um, decarbonisation and renewable, we established um, a year ago ARCA Horizons with a portfolio of renewable and clean tech um, uh, businesses. And in one year only, Acro Horizons has become the second largest asset in our portfolio. So it tells you a lot about the um, sentiment in the capital market. Mm -hmm. um, uh, industrial software is also a very important part of our future. And um, in four years only, we have built up Cognite, which is one of the f fastest growing industrial software companies in the world. And digitalization and automation is, as we see it, also a very vital piece of the decarbonization effort because it helps us to run um, uh, uh, gas turbines and other technologies far more efficiently and to drive down emissions. Mm. And last but not least, we have Occupy Marine harvesting krill in the Antarctic Ocean and pro uh, producing different products from the krill as uh, ingredients, including nutraceutical products uh, uh, to all of us. 
In case you have questions, please do uh, send it to menti.com. Uh, do you, any one of you have any comments, observations about our speakers today, our keynote speakers? Is there anything that... Yes, please. Uh. Yeah, well, one thing which was going through all the discussions and all the, all the presentations that had, which came very clear, especially from the Foreign Secretary and the, the Honorable and Gallant MP, was interdependence. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's anything this pandemic has shown us, it's the immense strength that you get when you combine the energies of the political world and uh, governments with the variety of the market, in, in especially in the way that we've been able to produce vaccines on a global scale in an unprecedented period of time. If you look at the Pfizer vaccine, for instance, I'm getting my second shot tomorrow morning, it contains almost 300 ingredients from 86 producers in 19 different countries. The, we had at least 200 different vaccines being tested and tried out, and some of them made it and are enormously successful. And this shows that it's possible to do things when you want to lift such efforts. And that in the interdependence that we can't do this alone. We have 0.1% of the world's population. 999 out of every thousand good ideas will emerge from somewhere else than Norway. Right, yeah. But, it, <laughs> but we, also, we also saw the lack of uh, dependent, independent relations, you know, the, the breakdown of this collaboration that also we saw in terms of the vaccine inequality and the vaccine nationalism, all that, you know, we saw on the other side, we saw this. So it was a clear demonstration of the dangers of when the uh, alliance breaks down, what are the dangers, and when the alliance holds together, what is it that how much humanity benefits? Yes, Evan, tell me. Yes, an another very interesting part of the presentation was uh, and what Nikolai Tangen said about active ownership. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> you asked me the question about the future of oil and gas, and it's no doubt about the fact that the world will consume oil and gas for decades to come. But the shift has happened um, very, very swiftly in the capital market. Mm. Um, and we experience all of us as business leaders um, how um, focus um, um, is made from investors on how we're allocating capital. And um, that's actually an even more efficient um, factor today and a more efficient force than the regulations. So um, it's uh, very important to understand the capital market mechanisms mm -hmm. in order to position ourselves for both the risks and opportunities coming forward. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're not, uh, you know, when you, Equinor, your earlier uh, organization, uh, when they uh, announced that they were putting in their money, you know, to, from the profitable oil and gas to the less profitable renewable energy sector, they lost 47 billion kroner, you know, it was wiped out from the... So how do companies remain sustainable? They benefit, she's benefiting, but maybe not oil, oil, uh, oil and gas companies are benefiting by this. How do you react to this and what is your response to the earlier speakers? Well, if you're a CEO of a company, basically you have only a limited set of way to spend your money. You can either invest in your existing business, you can hand back the money back to your owners with a dividend, or you can choose to diversify. And I think for Equinor to make no choice to say, okay, we're gonna spend some money on continued oil and gas, give some dividend to, to our share, but also invest into renewables and be part of the transition. Mm. I think may, there may be a blip on the share price the day that some announcements were made, but in the longer term, I think Equinor has been working for 10, 15 years to mature, mm. a build a renewables position. Mm. They've been in, had early access, and then at the later stage, been able to bring in other partners, mm. basically making quite a lot of profit, and with at least two examples with more than a billion dollar in profits. So, but if you're in the energy business, you need to have a long-term view. And for the global outlook, where do you believe the energy market will be 10 years from now? And, and the IEA report, the IPCC report, the market outlooks, the investors concerned, are all saying we would like to see slightly less oil and gas, or much less oil and coal, uh, and much more renewable. So I think you have a long-term perspective, uh, and you cannot be too scared about you know, what's, how this judgment is going to be tomorrow. Right? You need to believe in your own view right. on how the market is developing and how you can develop your company. Hilde. Yeah, we talked about uh, uh, joint efforts uh, in the pandemic, but I also would like to 
to, to uh, use the, the Green Deal in the EU as an example of a, of a joint effort uh, when, uh, when, first of all, the climate ambition is, 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 is clear to, to, uh, to everybody, uh, setting a, a, a clear target. But then also, uh, Green Deal is also about strengthening the, the industrial uh, value chains in order to be able to produce products and materials that is necessary to, to, take, to do the, the, the transition. Uh, and I think that is also something that uh, uh, companies also relate to and, and also policymakers uh, in the different countries that can support that uh, overall agenda. Mm. We have some uh, audience questions. Uh, this is to Yoon Gunnar. How will you assess the COVID tax release uh, package given to the oil industry and could it have been given a direction towards a green shift, not the opposite? Well... I don't think you can use short-term tax breaks with the limited time implications for fundamental changes of the economy. In order for people to really shift assets, they have to have long-term, sustainable, reliable and transparent um, uh, government regulations and incentives to adjust to. So to suddenly change taxes uh, as a short-term measure to implement green change. I don't think that would work. In order to do it, you have to do what's happening right now. We're having fundamental policy changes, we're having fundamental public opinion changes, and we're having fundamental changes in the market's investments and financial market assessment of environmental change. And that, those three forces together, public opinion, policy making, and market forces, that creates change. There's nothing that can resist that kind of major shift. The oil package itself, uh, theoretically, I could argue against it. Problem is, it worked. <laughs> well, the temporary uh, tax uh, uh, changes um, were of utmost importance uh, to Acker. I can hardly think about um, uh, Acker today without uh, the, the activity triggered by that um, um, political decision. And uh, it helped us to maintain capacity and competency of, of importance both for our oil and gas operation, but also um, uh, competency and uh, capacity um, of vital importance to establish companies like Arco Horizons and to transition the Arco Group into renewable energy and clean technology. Mm -hmm. So um, from our Arco perspective, um, <clears throat> the tax package was actually a very efficient tool uh, to help uh, Norwegian industry uh, to transition into a greener um, future. Uh, Bjornota, you have a lot of experience in Brazil and China, and uh, what we are seeing is that there is a lot of disinvestment that is happening in the oil and gas companies in the West, uh, but a lot of investment is flowing into what they call the pollution havens, where there is lax uh, or no regulations. <coughs> Uh, so isn't this actually just shifting the carbon emissions from one part of the world to another part of the world and it doesn't solve the planet's problem? Well, this is a debate often referred to as carbon leaks, and I think it's an important point. When it comes to the oil and gas industry, of course, assets are located physically in various countries. But there is an issue of who's going to own oil and gas or energy companies going forward. Will it be companies that are listed and that are transparent as part of the kind of Western shareholder um, mm. democracy, as uh, Tangan referred to, or, or would it be more private holding companies or only national oil companies? I think it's a genuine um, debate to be had. Uh, personally, I believe it's important that also, you know, large European companies are entitled to run energy companies and, uh, and so you know the recipe to, to handle that is, is through transparency and more or less global framework for investors like this uh, TCFT advice. What does the future of work look like? The future? Future of work. I would like reactions from all of you. What does the future of work look like? How will people, young people be working? <laughs> in, 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 pra in practical terms? It looks like the CEOs don't work. <laughs> well, uh, they don't need to. I'm happy to kick off. Um, <laughs> it, uh, w w um, the whole program here in Arndal is about energy transition. And um, uh, uh, Nikolai talked about uh, purpose. 
uh, that's the point of departure for young talent today. They mm -hmm. would like to have a job um, a, a with a bigger purpose. Mm -hmm. And then your question is probably about more the practical aspects. Yeah, um, I mean, and you know, the, uh, home, hybrid, office, what is... I, I think um, people, uh, they enjoyed working from home initially, but today yes. more and more people uh, uh, appreciate the fact that it has a benefit yes. to uh, belong to a working environment. So more flexibility, but the base will be uh, the office or, the, uh, or uh, with colleagues uh, also going forward, in, at least in the Arca Group. I right. fully agree with Eivind that... Uh, it was okay with home office uh, for a certain period of time, but the interaction and uh, the debates and the, the mingling in the, with the coffee machine is really important. But uh, on, on, the, on the broader topic, I, I believe that uh, there is a discussion about uh, that jobs will uh, not be there anymore. I, I think that uh, the more advanced we operate, uh, the more focused we are on being in control and capable to avoid any spillage, any uh, environmental effects. We need to monitor the processes even closer. Uh, and I think we need the crafts of the, of the operators, uh, perhaps in a, in a different way than the, than the raw uh, physical muscles. But uh, I believe that there is a variety of room for, uh, for work uh, for, for within different di disciplines uh, going forward. Also within automation and, and robots, but, uh, but in a variety of, uh, of areas. We take one last question from the audience to Yoon Gunnar. How will you assess the COVID? Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, whilst much of the West has minim minimized the recession or restarted growth, the global South is far behind. How will this affect the global economy? Well, it will potentially affect it uh, very, very badly. It can have an effect on how we are able to operate and on the lines of supply through the economy. It definitely uh, points to the fact that we are talking about energy change and transition and uh, a movement into a more resource um, uh, efficient economy uh, than we've had before. Movement and transitions that we really want and that we have been working towards over a long period of time. We use less resources per percentage of GDP now than we did before. However, that is under threat when we see the wide disparity and the, the widespread poverty uh, that this pandemic has now increased. We were on the path to extinguishing extreme poverty in the world within our own lifetimes. And for the first time since the UN started setting goals for doing this, we've had a tremendous setback in that. And that can create tension. It does create different interests and, and interests that are in conflict with each other. And it crea can create, as uh, several of the speakers were, were discussing, um, um, loss of faith in the international institutions which are there to handle this. So the, the total impact can be very negative. Yeah. Uh, one more question to Hilda. Uh, why is uh, Hydro going into the battery sector? Well, I think that uh, our, our focus, uh, I talked about aluminium, but we are also focusing on, uh, on energy as, uh, as an enabler for producing low carbon products. Uh, but batteries is also part of the energy system. And uh, we are well into the automotive segment with the producing uh, aluminium for the automakers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we see that with our capabilities in terms of uh, material, uh, material competence, uh, industrial competence, uh, we can be an enabler for uh, developing uh, um, profitable business, uh, businesses within the whole value chain of aluminium, both on the raw material, on the upstream part, uh, on, the, on the cell uh, manufacturing, but also on the recycling. And right now we are building a recycling facility in Norway to recycle electrical vehicle batteries uh, when they are coming back after use, uh, which then can provide the raw materials go back to the cell manufacturers. So, so uh, we believe with our competence uh, and industrial experience that we can participate uh, in the uh, huge uh, battery demands that we see going forward as part of the electrification of the transport segment. Yes, I remember when talking, uh, you mentioned this light aluminium, which is used for electric cars, which makes it very, very good for the electric cars to have this light uh, material, which you, know, you produce. So we will come now to the <coughs> final rapid fire round, where I will ask you a question and request an answer in one word. And the question is, 
President Biden says when he hears the words climate change, he hears the word jobs. When you hear the word recovery, what do you hear? Yungana, can we start with you? Optimism. Optimism, yes. Optimism. Hilke? Yeah, positive, uh, positive, uh, positive. development. Mm. Positive well, development. Better. Better. Mm. Yeah. Opportunities. Opportunities. Can we take that again? So that's uh, optimism. optimism, positive, better, and oh. optimism. <laughs> opportunities. Optimism <laughs> to opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you. As you can... As you can see, just one moment, I will do finish. <laughs> As you can see, you know, uh, we have from these four words tell you the important takeaways on recovery. We hope you enjoyed our uh, speakers today and a big, big thank you to all our speakers uh, for their wonderful uh, contributions. And I would also like to take a moment to thank the organizers of uh, Global Outlook, you know, the people behind the organizations who have worked hard and long to bring Global Outlook to you. I had actually wanted them to come on stage so that you can see them, but that is not allowed because of global, uh, because of COVID uh, restrictions. So I will just call out their names and a big thank you to Helena Flatmark, CEO of Ida Cluster, uh, Tonya Salgado, also of Ida Cluster, um, uh, Professor Stina Torriason, uh, University of Agder, and uh, then uh, from GC Node, we have Anne Marchioro and uh, Bente Lovos, uh, Sven uh, Buvik of uh, Guard, and uh, our tech gurus, uh, Dag and Eric. Thank you all so very much. I leave you with one final thought. With all their life experiences and wisdom, our speakers have taken us on a journey of recovery. You know, there's an old proverb which says, always expect rain, always expect people to be crooks. But today our speakers have shown us that there are reasons to be optimistic. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, it's insecure. Yes, things are changing. And yet our speakers have shown that there is, uh, there is optimism ahead. There are some sunshine and rainbows to expect in the form of new opportunities, collaborations, innovations. The question is, the question is, can we all rise to the challenge? It's not an option. We must. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for being part of Global Outlook journey and for